The journal Diabetes Metabolic Syndrome and Obesity put it quite nicely. We have migrated away from this paleolithic style of eating that we ate for however long into this Western style. But we've rapidly transitioned so fast that the rate at which our body can adapt to this new style of eating is much slower than the rate at which food technology and the availability of overnutrition and hyperpalatable foods is moving. So when you look at this new data, we see that by 2030, over 50% of the United States population is going to be obese. This is serious data, and I wanna break down what is causing this. Now, it doesn't take a rocket scientist or a brain surgeon to figure out that we have a serious energy balance problem. We're eating more and we're sitting more, but you don't need me in a YouTube video to explain that to you. What I wanna explain is the more nuanced stuff and the pragmatic stuff that you can do as a person to avoid this. Because if you're watching this video, you might be more metabolically aware. You might be more in tune with what's happening and it might make sense to you, but clearly, we are a runaway train in the United States. And if you look around at the vast majority of the population, they don't know what's going on. They aren't in tune with their bodies. They might know cerebrally, but they don't know metabolically. So let's fix this. So this study was published in the journal New England Medicine, okay? And it pulled a lot of data, okay? It looked at BMI from over 6 million people from the years of 1993 to 1994, and then 1999 to 2016. And I know what you're thinking. BMI doesn't matter. Yes, by BMI standards, I am morbidly obese. So yes, BMI has flaws, but when you're looking at very large cohorts, when you're looking at huge amounts of data, BMI is fairly accurate. Because although you might not think that BMI is accurate, most of the people that are falling into that category are overweight. It's a very small percentage of people that have a super high BMI, but are not obese. So largely, it makes sense. So what this study used is something called multinomial regression. And it did it for each state and for varying demographics. So essentially, they looked at sort of the acceleration of obesity throughout different years per different states and per different demographics. And with very high degrees of accuracy, it determined that 50% of the population in the United States will be obese by 2030. And in some states, it's going to be even more than 50%. Okay, they also found that 25% of the US population is going to be severely obese. And what's wild is that if you remember living in the 1990s, remember how frequently it was that you saw someone that was maybe moderately obese? Like, it would happen, but it wasn't like all the time. Well, severely obese people are gonna be just as prevalent in 2030 as moderately obese people were in the 1990s. That is scary. So what is causing this? What can we do? Well, let's start with something that is very much so directed at diet, and that is inflammation. And with this, I'm gonna look at some studies that compare us to the Mediterranean region, so we have a very clear indicator that since this is an issue predominantly with the West, we should look at the Western diet. So this study was published in the journal eLife, and it took a look at the Western diet compared to a Mediterranean diet. And they were looking specifically at the diet's effect on inflammatory gene expression. So not inflammation directly, but how the diets influenced the genes that regulate the inflammatory response. If we have more inflammatory gene expression, it means we're creating more genes associated with inflammation, which means we are at the uh, focal point of, or I guess the impetus of more inflammation. So they had subjects follow these diets, Western or Mediterranean, for 15 months. And after 15 months, they noticed that 40% of the genes that are involved in monocyte transcription had been altered. That means almost half of the genes that are associated with inflammation are altered by diet. And can you take a guess? Take a quick guess at which diet caused more inflammation versus less. I probably don't even need to tell you. But then we look at a study published in Scientific Reports in 2022. This was interesting because it demonstrated that the Western diet led to a more dysfunctional gut wall, and it led to a decrease in short-chain fatty acids. When we have a decrease in the gut integrity, we have a robust increase in inflammatory particles that end up in the bloodstream. It's not all rooted in the gut, but a lot of it starts there. And the reduction in short-chain fatty acids 
is, means that we're reducing something that is very, very good at modulating inflammation. You know how you correct this? You might not want to hear this, but it's a diverse diet. Now, full disclaimer, if you're someone that's doing carnivore or something like that, you're put into a, quite a different category. Okay, the reason is because when you're doing carnivore, you're very, very isolated and narrow. But if you're not doing carnivore, then it becomes this world where you really should have diversity. Carnivore, in essence, is a lifestyle that is very elimination-based. That's not all the benefit, but the benefit, one of the major benefits is elimination-based. I don't want to make this a carnivore video, I just have to make sure that that's separate and apart. If you're doing carnivore, you're a little bit exempt from the diversity equation. But other than carnivore, diversity is critical because diversity is going to create a more robust profile of the gut microbiome, which leads to more short-chain fatty acids. So what has happened in our culture, in our Western world, is we've narrowed the foods that we eat because we're eating so much processed food. So the diversity of nutrients that we get is much less. Where you look at Mediterranean, they've got vegetables, they've got fruits, they've got meats, they've got nuts, they've got cheeses. It's a nice whole earth profile of foods. So it doesn't mean that you just have to eat a bunch of Brussels sprouts and a bunch of vegetables. That's not the point. I'm not pushing some weird agenda here. That's not my goal. Okay, you can increase short chain fatty acids by increasing the intake of foods that are going to increase butyrate, butyrate producing bacteria. So yes, vegetables are in that category. High soluble fiber foods are going to be in that category. Chia, flax, psyllium husk. Okay, but you're also looking at foods that produce butyrate. Okay, good quality butter, preferably like raw butter. Okay, grass-fed, grass-finished butter. Good quality grass-fed, grass-finished meats. Some of the fats can actually help produce butyrate. Okay, ghee, especially ghee. Okay, one of the constituents of the fatty acid profile of ghee is short-chain fatty acids. So increasing those kinds of fats. Okay, while also decreasing the amount of trans fats. Okay, so hydrogenated, partially hydrogenated stuff. That's margarine. That's going to be in a lot of peanut butters. It's going to be in things like that. It sounds so simple but those are the kinds of things that matter. You can also add a probiotic into the mix. That's going to increase the diversity potentially of your gut, which can increase short chain fatty acid production. I popped a link for the one that I use down below. It's called Seed. They're a symbiotic, so they have a prebiotic and a probiotic, very unique technology. I don't really like probiotics most of the time because most of them are candidly BS, but this one is very, very interesting. The technology I do legitimately stand behind. So that link down below also gets you 15% off. So you use that code THOMAS15, you can try them out. Cool technology, that capsule inside of a capsule, which is pretty cool. I talk about it all the time on my channel. So I just think if it's something that you're trying to do by increasing diversity of your diet, it would be, in my opinion, somewhat of a disservice to not try to increase your microbiome content by adding in a probiotic. So check them out down below. But now we move into one that's seemingly glaringly obvious, and that is being too sedentary. But it goes beyond just being sedentary. There was a study that was published in the journal Diabetes Care that found that with the increase in sedentary time, there was an increase in waist circumference. All right, well, duh, it's kind of obvious. We know basic energy balance, right? But what the study further disclosed is that Ultimately, reducing sedentary time might have more benefits than increasing moderate to vigorous exercise. Let me say that again. Decreasing the amount of time you're sitting down might be more beneficial than creating a crafted exercise program. I think of myself when I was overweight, but I also think of some members of my family. I don't want to call them out, okay? But some members of my family that are very obese and they're struggling with it. And they are sitting there being like, I don't want, I, I just don't have the energy to start a workout. Okay. But I also know I'm very sedentary and I don't know, the idea of just getting up and walking more around the house and moving more, that doesn't seem like that's big enough to make an impact. I'm here to tell you that does make an impact. And getting up off the couch and even walking around your house and making a concerted effort to sit less might literally be more powerful than you going to the gym for an hour. That's not to say that the gym is bad, and that's not to say that exercise isn't going to be beneficial, because eventually you'll get there and it will become beneficial. But above being sedentary, it's much, much better. So let this be hope and motivation. Just don't sit down. Count your time sitting down instead of counting your exercise, and limit the time sitting down. Now, you can, I can break this down into a three-pronged issue. One, or A, is the basic energy expenditure. We're sitting down too much and eating too much. 
But B, when you're sitting down, you reduce circulating lipoprotein lipase. Lipoprotein lipase is an enzyme that acts like a pair of scissors and cuts up these big globs of fat, these triglycerides. So the scissors snip off the fatty acids so that the fatty acids can be burned. If these fatty acids are not snipped off, they never get burned. And you're sitting down, they don't get snipped off. But the moment you're moving, they can get snipped off. And there you go, fat burning can start. So even if it's just getting up to do the dishes, getting up a little bit more and walking around the house, that's gonna increase this lipoprotein lipase. Now, C is going to be screen time. Yeah, screen time's gonna make you sit down, but did you know that screen time is affecting the brain and increasing the motivated response to food? So they've looked at this with video gamers, like the more action-packed the game, the more they end up getting a dopamine hit and a motivated response from food. So the more enthralled you are in that show, and the more you're sitting down, the more opportunities you have to be stimulated by food or by shows, the more you're gonna eat. And the more you're gonna get a response out of eating. It's not just mindless eating. You're literally getting a bigger reward from it. And that is a fundamental issue. Which leads to where everything kind of leads into, the biggest issue in my humble opinion, insulin resistance. Which being sedentary, having inflammation, all of that comes to a head with insulin resistance. And that's where that study, Diabetes, Metabolic Syndrome, and Obesity, that talked about our massive movement away from this paleolithic style of eating. If you look at like Mediterranean styles, they really are eating much more paleolithic. We think paleo is like you gotta walk around with a giant turkey leg and a club. That's not what paleolithic is. Paleolithic just means living close to the earth and kind of like how we used to eat. But this massive migration away from that to the Western style where everything's available, that does lead to insulin resistance. There's a few issues. For one, if we're overweight and we have more fat, more fat is going to lead to more circulating fatty acids. So basically the fat on our body leaks fat into our bloodstream and this fat that's circulating around in our bloodstream actually ends up A, causing more storage, but B, it causes insulin resistance. Problem B is inflammation. Okay, the inflammation, like I mentioned before in the very beginning of this video, whether it's rooted from your gut or whether it's rooted from your diet or your inactivity, Inflammation acts like a static that impedes the signal of insulin, which means that the carbohydrates and the refined starches that we eat too much of now don't have somewhere to go. So they circulate, contribute to high glucose, they impede the action of lipoprotein lipase, they impede lipolysis, they impede hormone-sensitive lipase, they ultimately make it harder for us to lose. So we're in this vicious cycle, which leads to issue C, hyperinsulinemia. We have chronically high levels of insulin because we're eating so much refined BS, so much sugar, and we're constantly eating it. We're not eating it in controlled fashions. We're constantly grazing, keeping our insulin levels high all the time. You wanna know what that does in your body? A bunch of sugar is gonna to lead to high insulin. High insulin is going to stop the lipolysis, so it's gonna stop fat burning in its tracks, especially if you're in a caloric surplus, which you probably are in this case. And that's gonna to lead to high blood sugar pooling as well as high fatty acids pooling, and where does that sugar go? It goes and circulates around and it tries to get into the muscle cell, but the muscle cell won't let it in, so it goes into a fat cell, it goes into the adipose tissue, where it gets repackaged ultimately through what's called de novo lipogenesis and turns into, guess what? More fat. Now you have more fat, which leads to more inflammation, which leads to more insulin resistance, which leads to more blood sugar, which leads to more blood sugar going into the adipose tissue, which leads to more de novo lipogenesis, which leads to more fat, which leads to a runaway train in the year 2030. It's time to make a change. I'll see you tomorrow.